Well, hello everybody, it's me, Ollie, and I am so excited that you're joining us again today for We Are Ocean Vancouver, and this is episode number two. First, I would like to say how excited Cis and I are about the beautiful artwork that you've sent on our app, We Are Ocean Vancouver, that is now available on the iTunes store. Today, we will continue our tour of the Lost Lagoon and we will make our way all the way here at the edge of the Pacific Ocean on the unceded territories of the Musqueam, Squamish and tsleil nations. Haft squail eich tenoyup, toits tenat quien quen shaman, sis quien sna, and tenatlan, tenat chentla slahan ochameo, and Skomish uh, Chen, Iman, Tanatla Stalo, I Hawaiian, I Swiss, on Wanaxton Squalowin, on Hoth in Squalowin, Titsits. Hello, everybody. Uh, I'm Cease. I just introduced you to myself in my language, and I am hanging out in Stanley Park, uh, also known as Chai Thus. And here we are at the waterway that extends from the location of our last intervention with each other, where we talked about Lost Lagoon. So this little waterway here connects us to the ocean. So today we're going to talk about how different bodies of water, which are both human-made and natural occurring waterways that feed in and out of the ocean, and we want to also draw attention to, you know, the work and study we did in the Lost Lagoon module for our last conversation. It took place around Lost Lagoon, which is next to a causeway that was built in the, um, in the 30s in Vancouver. And that was a direct intervention with humans in a colonial way. And that colonial construct led to uh, the whole demise of the environment that we just studied, basically. So although it looked beautiful, you know, we had ducks and geese and turtles and otters, herons, um, several species of each wandering through here, we also have to note the fact that it's one of the most polluted bodies of water in this area. And as a result, these animals' lives are very resilient considering that they live in this environment where it is quite polluted, it's urbanized, and yet they somehow survive. They thrive and they, they still find a way of existing, coexisting with humans in a place that was theirs originally, in a place that, as we know, humans are the youngest species on the planet. And as a result, we have overpopulated already this planet and pushed species to the edge of, of extinction. And so when we're looking at environments like this and ecosystems, we're able to see firsthand our uh, part of that equation in deconstructing a beautiful ecosystem that we too as humans need to survive. If we don't have these plants and this waterway, the air isn't being cleaned. So we're gonna look at some species today that help us connect that healthy way of living and remediation in the environment with, uh, with urban spaces as well as forest spaces. So enjoy our walk. Well, it is totally shocking to me to hear that one of my favorite places in Vancouver is in fact one of the most polluted places in the area. What we're going to do now is that we're going to take some time with seas to look at some of these areas that are actually striving despite colonization and which elements of biodiversity are able to make a living here at the Lost Lagoon despite the pollution. So here we are now facing the other direction of this waterway and it, this is leading directly into the ocean is part of the Salish Sea that goes out to the great ocean, uh, our great ocean of which we are ocean. And so this, this whole little waterway shows a transition from that polluted zone as uh, a system of remediation. 
And when we look back on the last hundred years in this city and how this forest became a, a tailored park, so to speak, because a lot of the trees were taken out, the giant cedar trees, there were numerous ancient cedars in here. It was once an ancient forest uh, about 150 years ago. And then the forest industry essentially started in the southern coast uh, along the Pacific Northwest coast. And by the time it reached here from the redwoods all the way up to Alaska, we see everything wiped out. And so a lot of young, it's all, it's not even second growth. It's uh, some of it, it was left behind. So there's little tiny traces of old growth and second and third growth. And this area has been so tempered with in so many ways by the city of Vancouver, by other human intervention, people that live in the park, people that, uh, wander through and spend it's almost like a studio to them they use it in different ways so that often it, although it sounds idyllic it often adds to the pollution in the park and garbage left from people stripping bikes or people uh, living in the park and and not managing their waste in a good way and then everybody that just walks through here and enjoys the park for what it is so as you can tell, we're not far from a major uh, traffic zone. It's an artery that goes through the park. And we saw in the very first module uh, that there was a causeway. We talked about that being built and how Lost Lagoon became Lost Lagoon. It was a human intervention work. And now we're, into, we're fading into a natural zone where, although it's been tampered with by park uh, park workers of different kinds. It is now remediating itself through the grasses that grow on uh, the land between the shoreline and into the forest. And it also is about lichens and fungus growing on surfaces, whether it's, you know, logs or trees. All of these things start to gather the spores, which are, are very ancient. They're even older than this planet and have found their way here and have adapted this planet to our needs. So that is the power of these medicines and plants that are able to remediate sites that have been colonized and urbanized and polluted beyond belief. And that is the key to the plants and animals that thrive in this environment despite the fact they're very urban and often urbanized as we find with raccoons especially and uh, and often ducks and geese because they're expecting for people to feed them we don't really need to everything if we let the funguses and mushrooms and other plants thrive and we just work on managing invasives that don't belong in this environment what we'll see is a return to what it was 100 to 150 years ago on this site and we we need to remind ourselves that parks like stanley parks uh, stanley park is like a giant garden for the city they've intervened with it so much that they have essentially colonized it and urbanized it and when people start to do research about what this site looked like prior to contact and what it was as it was transitioning they can easily reinstate that by simply planting a number of indigenous plants. And we really have seen the success of indigenous plants being reintroduced to areas they've been removed from and how it not only fixes the air and the visual quality of a place, it also naturally invites different species of both plants and animals into those environments. So everything from lichens and other spore-based plants, mosses, ferns, to, uh, to the smallest creatures, the little pill bugs that help to remediate by eating everything in sight and uh, churning and turning it into soil and waste matter, as well as worms, it goes on. And then the bees, the pollinators, the hummingbirds, the other creatures, birds that start inhabiting and moving seeds and spreading them. This is how we 
allow the earth to remediate itself. And if we're going to intervene, we need to do it in a healthier way that assists everything around us in making that happen. So yeah, we'll be talking a lot about what it means to, to bring indigenous species into our, our worlds and our neighborhoods and how that is the key to uh, fixing our planet and fixing our community and keeping that quality of air and water in a healthy place. Well, I'm so happy that despite all of the pollution that there is at the Lost Lagoon, that some elements of biodiversity are actually striving. But as I'm making my way here to Second Beach, right at the edge of the Pacific Ocean in Vancouver, I'm actually quite concerned about the ocean health. Are there some things that I see every day that are contributing to ocean pollution and I don't even notice? Well, C is going to tell us all about it. Hasquile, here we are on the edge of the Shquen, also known to you all as the ocean. So we're hanging out, looking out at the bay that exists between West Vancouver and the west side of Vancouver and the edge of Stanley Park. So as we look out at the ocean, you can see a number of tankers behind me. And you can imagine if we were to go back in time, in a time machine, to the very beginning of when our people emerged from the ocean and from different animals, that we had begun a journey that connected the ocean and the forest for eternity. And as our, as our culture developed here on the Pacific Northwest Coast, we all became connected in our own ways, learning about the cedar tree, learning how it gifted us everything like transportation, housing, clothing, spiritual cleansing, and utility in forms with baskets and other tools. So for us as indigenous people, the Skomish Olchamea and all the neighboring nations around us, we see this body of water as part of us. We are part of the ocean. So you can imagine for my ancestors coming into that, that point in time where we had contact with European cultures less than 200 years ago on these shores and to look out at the inlet and beyond is the Salish Sea. Beyond that, the great ocean that connects so many people. It connects all the world together. So with, with that in mind, everything that my ancestors and the current uh, population of my people, the current generation, we still have that connection with the ocean. We still go to the ocean in great canoes. We paddle. We wear regalia made from the land. We gather our tools and our materials in natural ways still today. We also have to address the fact that this inlet that's filled with tankers is directly affecting everything of our current generations, our previous generations, and our future generations. And it's our future ancestors that I'm most concerned about because I think about what it will mean to them growing up watching this planet die when we in my generation have enjoyed thriving off of this planet and with it. And part of that destruction inevitably becomes the big issue is resource extraction. So the backdrop for my work here shows that element at it's clearest. It's an everyday feature of the landscape here on this ocean in Vancouver. It is the biggest concern, the biggest threat, and we need to deal with it before our next generation is stuck with not only a few tankers in this inlet, but hundreds, literally hundreds of tankers. That is my concern. I, don't, I do not want this visual to grow. I want it to go back to a time before there were tankers here. I think that the next generation deserves to be able to find the better ways of living off the planet without harming the planet, but rather giving back in a reciprocal way. And 
A lot of that comes from our personal ability to make choices. Do we, do we go with taking the, the route of destroying the forests and the ocean in order to create technology we don't really require or need? Or do we go in the direction of remediation and planting indigenous species on the shoreline, below the shoreline, and in the forest. So I hope that despite the stark reality of this part of this module, I cannot paint a pretty picture. I have to be serious and tell you that the future of the oceans and the forests are at stake in this time right now. And it is your generation and the next one that I want to help with teachings of the ancient forest, teaching of what old growth forests are, and how to properly live in balance in a reciprocal manner with our earth and with the ecosystems around us. At school or at home or on the app, you're going to learn all about the history of the geology of British Columbia and you're going to be able to explore in detail all of its beautiful diversity of life. But before we go, we're going to make our way now to Third Beach where Cease will tell us a story. That's right, it's story time! <laughs> Uh, I'm uh, from the Skolmish peoples and we're actually standing by this beautiful, beautiful transformed rock that was transformed by the Chais. And the Chais are the transformers, the great mythical creatures that came across this ocean and they travel together. They travel three brothers and one sister and they travel through the waterways and interact with the human beings and they sometimes bequeath them with gifts but sometimes in the case of this story they get turned to stone and they are immortalized forever as a story a legend that teaches us about that point in time when that human became a big giant rock so in the very very long ago it is believed that our people were both giants and little people. And the height that I am today, I am neither a giant nor a little person. So you can imagine if we were giants this size and little people, maybe, maybe this high, would be interacting with these giants. But that's for another story. The story today is how this man became a giant rock. And in indigenous, belief systems, rocks are ancestors. They're the oldest beings on the planet. And the trees, including the, every plant, all plants are grandmothers. They're the second oldest beings on the planet. So this story is about a young man that came to the water, to the ocean, to cleanse himself and to become pure and clean and to become the best man he could be and not far into the forest, his wife was giving birth to their first child. And so he was preparing to become a father and to become a father in the most open way. He wanted to enter into fatherhood with his mind clear, his spirit clean, and his heart lifted up and ready for that beautiful, important lifelong work of raising a child. So as he was bathing on the shore, along came the Chais in a great snakwail, a great canoe. And these beautiful, beautiful mythical beings came up to the young man in the water and they asked him to, they demanded he get out of their way. They said, human being, leave, go away. 
and they, the man continued to cleanse himself. He continued to purify himself. He said, I cannot leave. Do you know who we are, humans? We are the highs. He's like, I know who you are, and I know you carry great knowledge, and I know that you can destroy me. But my most important work is to become the best father I can become. I'm about to become a father. And the highs were, they were so shocked that a human would talk to them with such stern and confident mannerisms. And they, they looked amongst each other and they decided to turn him into a giant stone because they were so impressed. They, they were like, the people should know that this is a great Canaan. This is a great warrior. He has stomps, he has strength. And so they formed him into this beautiful, beautiful rock that lives, lives here forever. And at the very moment that he turned to stone, there was a great scream in the forest, ah! and great tears. It was the mother had given birth and was holding her child up and witnessed what the Chais had done to her husband. So she was terrified and she began to run, to run through the forest. She ran all the way to the other side of that point. And as she dove into the water, throwing her child into the air and into the water, they both landed as stones where they are also immortalized forever. Well, that's all the time we have for today for We Are Ocean Vancouver episode two. But, this doesn't end here for you. You have homework. Cease and I would like to see a model of your favorite ecosystem that is here in Vancouver or wherever you are in British Columbia or around the world. When you're done, your model or your drawing, because we accept every type of art because we love everything that you do, all you have to do is take a picture of your work and upload it onto the We Are Ocean Vancouver app. And make sure when you write a little description of your work that you tell us how this ecosystem is connected to the ocean. So thank you very much again for tuning in. We can't wait to see you again for episode number three. Bye!